Hello, everyone. There will not be a show on Sunday, uh, uh, April 7th, uh, because the whole weekend is booked with stuff. So in lieu of that, we've pre-recorded this special edition on the Oregon Delegate Selection Plan. I hope you enjoy it. We will return on the 14th with another edition of Progressive Oregon. Thank you. Hello, this is Larry Taylor, and this is a special edition of Progressive Oregon. Uh, what we are talking about uh, in this edition is the uh, Delegate Selection Plan for the 2020 Democratic National Convention. Uh, this is issued the year before the convention, and uh, it's always of interest because there's some very complex rules that go into uh, creating this. So the plan was released on April Fool's Day. Um, it had been developed by an ad hoc committee uh, not the Rules Committee, and so we were very interested to see what they had come up with. Um, so the, the, the plan is what guides the selection of delegates in each state. So there should be uh, 50 states plus whatever territories are involved in the convention uh, working on this right now. It is due at the Democratic National Committee Rules Committee uh, at the beginning of May, where they will then review the plan that uh, that Oregon has produced along with the rest of the states on uh, whether it's fair and equitable and, and they've uh, actually adhered to all the rules and guidelines that they had been issued. The first thing that everyone is interested in finding out is how many delegates uh, do we get to send from Oregon? In 2012, there was about a thousand more delegates and the convention was really, really, really packed with people. Uh, for 2016, they cut back significantly on the number of delegates uh, and, but we still had around 65, 66, something like that. Uh, this time we, we have 66 delegates. Uh, and so this slide talks about how the delegates are apportioned amongst the different categories. Um, the districts are the five congressional districts. And so we have 34 de delegates that are apportioned to the congressional districts that will be elected first in the district delegate selection convention. Um, then we have a group called Automatic Party Leader and Elected Official Delegates, of which there are 14. These include Ellen Rosenblum, uh, because she's the chair of the National Association of uh, Attorneys General. And we have Tina Kotek, because she's the chair of the DCCC, I believe. And then we have a um, uh, third one, whose name escapes me. Um, uh, and then we have the two senators and four representatives. Um, and altogether, they comprise 14. This also includes the five uh, DNC members. That's the chair, the first vice chair, and then the three that we elected uh, a couple of years ago. Then we have a category called pledged party leader and elected official delegates. These are uh, people like big city mayors, and that's actually the term that they use in the plan. So I guess Ted Wheeler would qualify, but uh, our mayor of Astoria, if he were a Democrat, would not. Uh, and these are pledged. So they will be able to vote in the first round and they get to run for the seven slots that are reserved for them. And this is what, um, uh, from what I can tell, cuts into the total number of, uh, you know, grassroots, ordinary civ civilians being delegates. Um, uh, and it seems to counter the uh, the superdelegates that are not going to be voting in the first round. But that's just my, my uh, interpretation of what's going on. Then there are 11 at-large delegates that will be elected at a state convention in mid-June, a couple of weeks after the district-level convention. Uh, this w is where they will be urging people to uh, to balance out the delegation so that we meet both the, the gender balance requirements and the affirmative action guidelines that they've set out for us. And I'll be talking about those in a little bit. Uh, giving us a total of uh, 66 delegates and four alternate delegates. So um, it appears that at the state convention, we will be electing alternate delegates as well. This is the next next slide is the breakdown of the delegates by congressional district. So uh, congressional district one, which is the um, northwest corner of the state, uh, will be electing seven delegates in total. 
the second delegation, second congressional district, which is the two thirds of the state on the east, will be electing five. And the reason why the number is so low is because the the number of Democrats and the to the number of Democrats in the entire population is is very low compared to the next congressional district three, which is Mul which is uh, district three is basically Multnomah County, and they get ten. Uh, the next one is congressional district four, which is the uh, uh, southwest corner of the state. They get six, and then uh, district five, which is kind of in the middle on the west. Um, also gets five, and so that's how we get a total of 34 uh, delegates that will be elected at the district um, uh, elections. Now, it's going to get complicated if there are multiple uh, candidates still in the running when we get to the primary. So if we still have three major contenders uh, and they generally get, and, and they get more than 15% of the vote, then the delegates in each district will be divided amongst the um, uh, the winners of the of how many votes were cast in the primary for the candidates. So, say it's candidate A, B, and C, and the distribution is thirty percent, thirty percent, and forty percent. Then thirty percent of of ten delegates in Multnomah County will go to candidate A. Thirty percent will go to candidate B, and then forty percent will go to candidate C, and then in the state in the in the counties where there are less or excuse me the districts where there are less delegates uh less um delegates elected you can see that it's going to get much smaller and the number of slots available to each person will be uh much lower uh and so the competition for these will be higher because there's only going to be one or two slots that people can run for uh, the good parts of the delegate plan that was released um, so they had added rules for the selection of members of the three committees the rules the platform and the credentials committee um, in 2016 i was uh along with annabella jaramillo we were uh the members of the rules committee uh and we got to do things like vote on the unity platform and uh resolutions have been brought before the convention uh to change some of the the uh, uh the way the things were being run they will be elected by the uh, uh, delegation at the state convention on June 20th. Um, rules were added for the selection of the delegation chair. This was something that uh, caused a minor riot in 2016 because the rules had not been clear on how this was done. And um, the, the, the delegation that had received the most delegates, which was the... Uh, Bernie Sanders delegate felt that they should choose who the delegate lead should be in the convention um, and the leadership of the party thought otherwise and so we had some awkward moments where that was worked out <laughs> but everyone lived. Um, the CD2 issue of them having two, two conventions uh, was uh, addressed in this plan and what happened uh, in 2016 is that 25% of the males and 25 in, in one half of the CD and 25% of the females in the other half that were pledged for Hillary Clinton were ineligible to run for those positions uh, because they only had uh, two to fight to, to run for and they had two conventions. And so that's how they split it up. So that has been addressed, although uh, uh, it appears that some more work needs to be done on how that's going to be done because uh, the what is proposed in the plan actually violates the DPO bylaws. <clears throat> and the questionable parts, and this is not a complete list because uh, there's there's parts of it that are not written as clearly as we would wish, and so we have to go back over them and and uh, make sure that uh, we understand proposed. But these are the things that popped out. So in numerous places, they talk about plurality voting. Uh, that is not a thing. Uh, we cannot do plurality voting unless the uh, state central committee allows for it and puts it in the bylaws for all intents and purposes. Um, and it would, and even if it didn't have to be in the bylaws, it would require a two thirds vote because this is uh violating one of the fundamental rules of parliamentary procedure which is majority rule so it's possible for people to win if you use plurality voting who did not get 50 uh, 50 percent uh, of the votes uh proposing 
They are proposing that the authority for final corrections be given to the DPO chair rather than the rules committee. We think that is a, a questionable decision. Um, they've the executive committee is, is the approving the plan in place of the state central committee. So if you have watched our previous shows, you know that the state central committee is the ultimate authority of what happens in the party. The st executive committee is chartered to do things in between state central committee meetings. Uh, some of the goals need further detail to comprehend, and I'll talk about the one that, that sort of jumps out uh, in that part. Um, they've proposed electronic voting in CD2, which uh, has, is truly not authorized in the bylaws. And so unless we change the bylaws of the Democratic Party, uh, uh, this can't be done. Uh, and if they are proposing that balloting be on one ballot, um, uh, then that's not going to fly because the balloting for alternates need to, needs to be separate. So to go, just d drilling down into each one of these and the, the logic behind them, uh, number one, plurality voting. This is on Robert Rules of Order, page 405, lines 2 through 13. Um, a plurality that is not a majority never chooses a proposition or elects anyone to office except by virtue of a special rule previously adopted. We do not have a previous rule, a special rule previously adopted for this, so they cannot do that. Uh, if such a rule is to apply to the election of officers, it must be prescribed in the bylaws. It's not in the bylaws. A rule that a plurality shall elect is unlikely to be in the best interests of the average organization. And the reason why is because uh, you get people elected who are not elected by the majority. Um, and then Robert's Rules recommends a better method in such cases is for the bylaws to prescribe some form of preferential voting, which they could do if they would like to do that. So we gotta fix the plurality voting and our recommendation is gonna be that they just uh, say majority vote. Uh, uh, otherwise it would take, at this point in time, uh, probably a lot of time to work through the issues of which preferential voting system we'd wanna use and what we could accomplish uh, next year. Uh, the second point is the DPO chair makes final corrections. So two points on this one. Uh, there was no member of the ad hoc committee that has any credit any credentials for creating rules, um, <clears throat> including being a member of the rules committee. And the chair also has no credentials for creating rules. So our recommendation is that the final corrections be completed by the rules committee. The next point is about the executive committee approving the plan. So who and what is the executive committee? Um, so what it is, is it acts for the state central committee when time does not permit properly calling an a state central committee meeting, which doesn't really fit in this circumstance because we've known about this plan for, oh, four months. <laughs> um, but who is on the executive committee? So it's the DPO officers, the five standing committees, the five standing committee chairs, six at large members, 17 caucus chairs, five CD chairs, and roughly 55 state and federal office holders and statewide officers. So there's a possible 96 attendees to the meeting, although no one can ever recollect an elected official uh, filling their role on this committee and showing up. Uh, and we have a bad history of not running the executive committee meetings as deliberate assemblies with uh, all the rules in place for uh, uh, people being able to participate as they should. So uh, that meeting is scheduled for the end of the month. And so what we wanna do is make sure that there's a complete understanding that that meeting will be run as a deliberative assembly. So people are free to exercise their rights as they uh, should be. Item number four, um, the goals are supposed to reflect the population. And so what this slide is, is a, a distribution of the goals for the various identity groups. Um, and this was the work of the Affirmative Action Committee. <clears throat> and what they were supposed to do is come up with percentages of representation for each of these categories and then calculate the number of, of delegates that fit those characteristics as a goal. So it's not a mandate, but it's a goal. And Oregon has a really good history of exceeding the goals in this. So that's why our delegation has has consistently been very, very diverse. 
so the, for the Af African Americans, uh, we need a minute. We we should elect a minimum of three. Um, there should be a minimum of eight Latino Hispanic Americans. There should be a minimum of two Native Americans. Um, there should be a minimum of four Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. There should be a minimum of seven members of the LGBTQ population. <clears throat> um, and there should be 18 people with disabilities, 22% uh, uh, young Democrats. And this has a very broad meaning. It's people that are 36 and under. Uh, so that should be pretty easy to hit. Uh, there should be 13 rural Democrats and then two veterans or active service members. <clears throat> the one that really pops out is the one for persons with dis disabilities. So they're saying that 25% of our our population is classified as disabled, which uh, strikes me as being very high. So we have to get a little more clarity on what they are calling disabled. So people will have an understanding of whether or not they fit in that category. Um, and the next slide is a little bit more on that. So the goal for people with disabilities was established after looking at a survey from Pew Research that was based on estimates from the American Community Survey on people with disabilities living in Oregon. Um, and they say they estimated the number of people with disabilities ages 18 and over factored in the percentage of voting age people in Oregon who are registered to vote and further factored in the turnout percentage in the 2018 election and that's how they came up with 25 percent so again we just need to understand uh what are the characteristics that qualify as a disability so we can understand how you know if uh, people qualify for that uh that category number five on voting uh so robert's rules of order uh is very specific about what you can and can't do with voting so on page 409, lines 26 to 35, it gives you uh, four regular methods of voting. Uh, these are, are what you can use without any special rules. So it's voice, rising, which is standing up to be counted, a show of hands, and then there's a, uh, the concept of unanimous consent. On electronic voting, which is what the delegate plan is, is proposing on pages 412 through 429, it says, in contrast to the methods of voting mentioned in the preceding subsection, the voting methods described below are used only when expressly ordered by the assembly or prescribed in its rules. And number two on the list is machine or electronic voting. So the language is very clear on this. Um, we can't do it unless we authorize rules for it. Um, and uh, we've used electronic voting in the past. Uh, we've seen uh, vote counts where there were more votes than the people who are registered to vote. And so uh, this, uh, you know, it's got to be a very airtight system if, if we are proposing to do this. Uh, and again, there are no provisions for electronic voting in the bylaws of the Democratic Party of Oregon. So in fact, any past voting that we've done electronically is not valid. Uh, including, I believe, the election of two of the DNC delegates, but no one contested the elections at the time, and so for all intents and purposes, all those previous votes stand. Um, on electronic participation, and this is this is their proposal for solving the problem with the second con con congressional district because it is so large. Um, it says the exception of to having one convention in in each. Um, one face-to-face -face convention in each congressional district is the second congressional district, which is one of the geographically largest districts in the United States. As such, the second congressional district will be held as a hybrid convention where Democrats eligible to participate will have the option to participate either in person or remotely via a secure online balloting system. Uh, so that system remains unidentified. And as I said, it's not authorized. So we don't, it's, this is gonna be a stretch to pull off. Uh, and then one more thing on electronic participation. Uh, on page 97, it says, except as authorized in the bylaws, the business of an organization can be valid validly transacted at a regularly called meeting, a gathering in one room or area. Uh, Roberts really likes people to be able to uh, debate and have a discussion uh, before they vote. Um, and then on the next page, it further 
says that an electronic meeting that is properly authorized in the bylaws is treated as though it were a meeting at which all the members who are participating are actually president, present. But uh, again, it says properly authorized in the bylaws and it is, we do not have that at this point in time. Also an electronic participation on the next slide. Um, and this is all that the DPO bylaws say. It says in section eight, article five, electronic meetings, notwithstanding any other provision in this article, an emergency meeting may be conducted by telephone or video conference subject to the call of the chair or a majority approval of the administ admi administration committee. Um, so this is just about SEC meetings. It says nothing about conventions. Uh, and so the, the bylaws are silent on this. Um, the DPO bylaws do not authorize electronic meetings other than standing committees or ad hoc committee meetings. So the ad hoc committee that put together this plan could meet uh, and, uh, and uh, validly conduct a meeting, but um, other meetings uh, are not authorized. And in bylaws, you have to, if things are listed, then that means that things have to be listed in order to be valid. If they're not listed and other things are, then they're clearly excluded. <clears throat> and finally, number six, separate ballots for alternates. Uh, so democracy is not served if you shove the leftovers into an alternate delegate slot. Uh, we've had a practice of doing that uh, and we've started to change that this year. Uh, I have a separate presentation where I go through examples of of how voting occurs both with everyone on one ballot and after the delegate slots are filled the alternate delegate delegate slots are filled with uh, the leftovers and then as if they are are elected on two separate ballots and you you can see how you can get quite quite different results uh, and this goes back to the the concept in democracy of majority uh, majority rule and so a majority has to pick the uh, the delegates, unless you have a special rule that says otherwise. Next slide. Uh, so if you would like to read this document and give comments, uh, we've been told that when they submit the plan uh, after it's finalized in Oregon uh, at the beginning of May, they will also, they're also required to send in all of the comments that people have registered in the um, uh, uh, here uh, so that the Rules Committee of the Democratic National Committee can review the comments that people submitted. And so uh, if you go to dpo.org, you can see this lovely um, uh, bird graphic. And if you click on that, you will come to the delegate plan page and you get these options here where you can uh, download the plan for yourself and read the uh, 40 odd pages. And then you can also click on the other button that says click here and submit your own comments. And then that will be sent to Washington DC um, and bundled into the greater discussion. Uh, the DPO rules subcommittee that is actually chartered to do this plan would also like to hear your thoughts. And so if you would please share them with us, uh, go to www.advancementofdemocracy.org. And uh, again, there's a button for linking you to the plan. So if you want to connect to the plan, just click on read plan. And if you have comments on any section, like if uh, you don't like how the non-binary voting is going, is prescribed or uh, any aspect of the plan that you don't like, we would really like to hear from you uh, because uh, we will be submitting our changes as well. And we would like to bundle them uh, to maximize our effect. So some closing comments on this. Um, and this is to our leadership of the Democratic Party. Don't profess that you are working for party unity when you blatantly violate the, the rules. So a standing, assigning standing committee work uh, to an ad hoc committee is a blatant violation of the rules. And you have once again, pissed off a lot of people uh, because you're not playing by the rules. Um, you're just in reinforcing the belief and the that the process is rigged and you drive good people away. And if that isn't enough to appeal to your higher moral uh, compass, uh, this costs you money because people take their money and they walk. So uh, thank you for listening to this. We encourage everyone to go out and read the plan and submit your comments so that we end up with the best plan possible uh, when we go to select our delegates to go, go to the convention. 
Uh, and if everyone is happy, the number of riots <laughs> that occur next year will be minimized. Thanks you very much.